Hey, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Katrina Trinka, Editor-in-Chief of The Daily Signal. And with me, of course, the reason you're all here, Jarrett Stepman. He is a contributor to The Daily Signal, podcast host of The Right Side of History. And of course, he's the author of a new book, The War on History. Jared, I think you're supposed to hold it up so everyone sees it. It's fully aware. <laughs> um, you all want to buy it if you don't have it. There are copies for sale available right outside after the event. Sorry, I'm really shameless at this kind of thing. So just putting it under radar. Um, so Jared, I want to start off and ask you, why did you write this book? I mean, obviously money and having a book. But besides that, I think you had more noble reasons. Well, uh, Kate, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody uh, for being here today. Uh, I think the reason that I wrote this book, and Kate, you know from a lot of the pieces I've written over the years at The Daily Signal, uh, I think there is a concerted uh, attack on American history. I think it's it's been building for a long time. We have a generation of especially younger Americans who uh, lack a lot of knowledge about American history. And I think right now we are seeing outright attacks on a lot of the figures who were once venerated in American history. And I think it's become uh, an escalating thing over the years. We've seen uh, statues, murals being taken down. We've seen people uh, like Thomas Jefferson, uh, once uh, widely venerated American by people across the political spectrum, uh, whose legacy is coming under question, who many say we should remove from statues and things like this. And I think that we are at a critical time. I think that the United States we have a shared history. We have a shared history of ideas and people in this country. Uh, to, to, for our future, I think it's important that we keep that, that legacy alive, especially for, again, the younger Americans who are lacking a lot of this knowledge about our nation's past. So what are the threats to our country if the younger Americans, as you mentioned, don't really know our history or learn an incorrect version? What, what does that mean on a practical level? Well, I, I think it, it means a, a, a number of things on a practical level. I mean, something that has really sustained a republic, part, part of the reason why we even have a public ed education in this country, and some of the initial arguments was to build citizens in a republic, that civic knowledge was important for us to make decisions about our future, about uh, our daily lives and politics. And having an understanding of what happened before, having an understanding of uh, the critical ideas uh, that have made our country what it is, I think are essential uh, for the future of the country. And to see, especially now, many of the most critical things that make America great to begin with, that they are under attack. And you have a lot of younger Americans who simply don't understand the basics of why do we have a constitution? What is the Declaration of Independence all about? These are very basic things that, I mean, you look at polls uh, are, are quite sobering as far as, I mean, we actually, uh, I had a piece this last year about this poll that was conducted that showed that only about a third of Americans could even pass a citizenship test in this country. And so I think you have a combination of a lot of ignorance on one side and an education system that has failed many young Americans uh, combined with, I think, a lot of uh, bad ideology, a lot of indoctrination. I mean, we've also seen you know, polls of ideologies like socialism uh, rising among younger Americans in particular. I, I think that those things aren't necessarily connected, but I think that there is a connection there. If you, if you don't have an understanding of what this country was built on, the Constitution, the Declaration, you are more apt to embrace radical doctrines. And... What, were, what would you say are some examples of those radical doctrines? I think you've written a lot for the Daily Signal about the Electoral College and what the left um, doesn't understand about its origins. Is that one of those things that you would say that with a better understanding of history, Americans might think differently of the Electoral College? Well, I do. I do think once they are uh, educated about the origins and the history of the institution, I think that there is a lot of appeal. Of course, we use the word democracy, I think, sometimes not correctly, uh, I think, in a lot of cases. But 
Um, the Electoral College is a foundational part of our system. It's the way that the founders created to elect presidents in this country. It was based on a system of federalism that I think is essential to how America works. I mean, you look at the, the debates at the Constitutional Convention, uh, the Electoral College was a, a widely agreed upon thing, ultimately, and, and the convention was a very contentious place. Uh, I think it served this country very well over our history. I mean, the succession uh, from one leader to the next is something that has destroyed many republics in the past. We've been very fortunate that we've had that kind of smooth transition. And I think that system has served this country very well for a long time. And, you know, we see, of course, a lot of arguments from some saying that our system is not democratic, it's not fair. Uh, but our system has, crea has, has created a lot of great leaders, a lot of great presidents. And I think that to abolish it now would be reckless. And I think that a, a deeper understanding of why the institution was placed there to begin with I think does prevent people from embracing that radical step, which is abolishing it. So your book, of course, is called The War in History, and you've already mentioned that we've seen murals being attacked, that we've seen statues being attacked, and you know, there's really been a huge uptick in recent years. I don't think anyone actually tracks statistically how many statues were uh, attacked in a given year, but um, obviously it's more than it used to be. Why do you think, you know, 2018, 2019, why at this moment in time, are we so obsessed with our history? And what happened to create that? Yeah, I think especially the attacks on statues, I think are really partially a product of, you know, we have something we call cancel culture in modern America, where you say one thing wrong, you do, you have one misstep, and you're obliterated from social media platforms, you're removed, and we really are applying this kind of cancel culture to the past. And it's amazing that in the last few years in particular, we've seen such a, I mean, you talk about slippery slope. I think in not a lot of these initial debates over history and statues, they kind of started with Confederate monuments and memorials and how quickly they moved to Thomas Jefferson, how quickly they moved to, I mean, there's a mural of George Washington in San Francisco that's being covered up. I mean, just recently, Charlottesville actually uh, voted to get rid of a, a Lewis and Clark statue uh, because they said that a Sacagawea was not displayed correctly, it was offensive. I did not find the statue to be offensive. But I mean, now we are really just going through every part of our history and looking for reasons to destroy it and get rid of it. And I think that that is unfortunately a product of uh, cancel culture and a lot of the identity politics of the modern day that I think is getting very ugly. Okay. So we're in November. Thanksgiving is coming up. Um, you write in your book, you have a whole chapter on Thanksgiving. So what are some of the myths surrounding Thanksgiving? And what is the truth about that holiday's origins? Thanksgiving is uh, an incredibly important holiday to the history of the United States. Of course, most know the initial story of the pilgrims, that, that first Thanksgiving. There are actually many first Thanksgivings. Uh, it, it really has been an evolutionary holiday. I think there's always the kind of gotcha articles about well, the pilgrims didn't really eat turkey on Thanksgiving. That really isn't the reason we have uh, Thanksgiving. And, right? and I, yes, I know, it's, it's an incredible thing. There wasn't actually turkey that was consumed on Thanksgiving. Uh, I think their diet was actually very much different at that time. But that's not the essential quality of, of why we have Thanksgiving. And it's really incredible. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of articles and a lot of publications saying that Thanksgiving is something that needs to be, you know, we shouldn't really be celebrating this, that Thanksgiving itself is problematic. There's these calls that the pilgrims were genocidal. Uh, and I think a lot of those attacks, I think, are based on, I think, a lot of bad history. I think that Thanksgiving itself, which has evolved as this great holiday, especially in the 19th century. I, uh, one person in particular I highlighted in my book was uh, Sarah Josepha Hale. Uh, not many people today know who she is. She really is the godmother of Thanksgiving. She promoted in the 19th century that America needed a cultural holiday of giving thanks uh, for what we had in this country. And ultimately, she spoke to the ears of many presidents for, for a generation that yeah, I think her words fell on deaf ears until President Abraham Lincoln took up the cause uh, during the Civil War. Uh, an interesting time to be you know, celebrating a Thanksgiving, but it was very important uh, for Americans at that time to give thanks for the, for the things that they have. Um, I think what we're seeing now, and I do talk about the reason, you know, we, we celebrate Thanksgiving and giving thanks is so important because I think it's really being replaced by a, a new ethos of, of grievance. Uh, 
I think we do see that, you know, that's, that's kind of an overwhelming whelming doctrine, I think, that is embraced by so many Americans that instead of being uh, thankful and grateful for what we have in our history, uh, we have uh, a grievance, you know, things are... A festivus. Uh, yeah, it's like a festivus, but kind of the, uh, on the other foot. And uh, I think that is a, a, a problem, I think, especially, you know, we're going to see, especially as the Thanksgiving holiday uh, draws near, we're going to see a lot of attacks on, on the holiday, which is so important. I mean, it's a shared... It's a shared cultural holiday, and I think that's something that really struck me. My 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 wife, who, whose parents actually grew up uh, in the communist Soviet Union, uh, they're immigrants to this country. Uh, how important Thanksgiving is to them because they feel that they are part of America. They are giving thanks. They understand uh, what there is to be thankful for in this country. You know things that that don't exist around the world. I mean, not just material prosperity, but that you have uh, the right to to worship the way you want. You have the rights. Uh, that are guaranteed under our Constitution. They are thankful for the generations of Americans who made that possible. And I think that's such an important and critical holiday. Uh, it's, it's a part of binding the country together into something that's a, a shared tradition. That's so interesting because I hadn't really thought about the war on Thanksgiving being at all about, uh, essentially to dumb down what you said, the war on gratitude. Like this perspective that, oh, we can't be grateful because that means America has some good parts. So we have to... That's really fascinating. You mentioned, um, you know, this lefty talking point that the pilgrims are genocidal. You also got into Christopher Columbus in the book. You know, you and I both grew up in California in the Bay Area. And I remember dressing up as a pilgrim in kindergarten, which I cannot imagine a California public school would allow these days. But I'd be curious, what would you say, you know, to a parent whose child comes home and says, I learned in school today the pilgrims were genocidal, which I bet is happening. What's the truth there? Yeah, I mean, certainly, and going back to Columbus, it's quite incredible that, you know, within a generation, Columbus was so widely respected and admired. I mean, if you do ask your average student today and who goes to a modern public school, they'll probably tell you Columbus is this awful man. He's just a terrible, evil monster. You know, I do go through in my book, uh, basically, I lay out the case for Columbus. I, I think that there are a lot of reasons to continue celebrating him. I think that Calling him a genocidal maniac, which is, I think, what a lot of the accusations that are out there is incorrect. I think it's incredible. I mean, just this year we had the D.C. City Council in the, I mean, the District of Columbia City Council abolishing Columbus Day, uh, which is incredible. I mean, this is a, basically a, a city that the founding fathers, I mean, this is what they named after Columbus, the goddess Columbia. Uh, that's where it derives from. And it's quite incredible how we've seen in a generation. I mean, it, in 1992, is in Berkeley, California, they had they first did Indigenous Peoples Day, which was a big deal at the time. And at the time, it was uh, it was basically just oh, you know, it's Berkeley. They do crazy things in Berkeley. Uh, but look how it spread across the country. I mean, that in, the, in those years afterward, something that was written off as a, as a crazy wild thing uh, now is the norm. And I think the idea that, that that Columbus is kind of some kind of genocidal monster, I think it's based on a lot of bad history. Some of this coming from uh, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, which I think has done a lot of uh, damage. I think it's, it's far too widely used in high schools across the country, uh, attacking Columbus's legacy. And while Columbus, I don't think himself, was uh, perfect by any stretch, uh, I, do, I do think he leaves a great legacy that is worth celebrating. And to pin him off as some kind of uh, Hitler of, of a, an earlier time, I think, is, is deeply unfair and it's very much against the historical record. So in The War in History, you also talk about the founding. And you really zero in on Thomas Jefferson and his reputation currently. So tell me about that. Do you think he's misunderstood today? Do you think we see his legacy in the correct way, how should we view him? Yeah, it's funny that, you know, you see, as we see Alexander Hamilton get a little bit of a bump because of the musical that came out, we see Jefferson's reputation falling. And, and to a certain extent, it makes sense. I mean, Jefferson uh, was a, a slave owner. Jefferson was, in many cases, you know, you could say that makes him politically incorrect. And I think that it's incredible to see Jefferson's legacy in particular being attacked. And he does open himself up to attacks because the man who is the slave owner is tortured by the idea of slavery. This is the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, said in that declaration that we hold certain truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And yet we see at the same time Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. And I think 
I think we, under, we, we sometimes misread this and say, well, did he not mean what he said in these words? And I think if you do go through the words of Thomas Jefferson, he very much meant what he said. And I think that uh, generations of, of Americans thereafter used his words as a, as a rallying cry. I mean, certainly when you talk about the legacy of Abraham Lincoln, you know, he said in a birthday celebration of Jefferson, all credit to Thomas Jefferson for injecting those words, all men are created equal, into the Declaration of Independence. In a nation in which uh, race-based slavery was very much a reality, I mean, slavery itself was very much a reality for, for most of human history, that Jefferson had the forethought to inject that into our country's founding document. Uh, that's an incredible thing, and that's something that the generations who came after who opposed slavery used as a rallying cry, and I think that is that is Jefferson's legacy. I think this idea that because he was a slave owner, we can't celebrate him. You know, Jefferson did something that was incredibly brave. Americans had to, pur to purge the evil of slavery in this country. How are they going to do it? Through the philosophy of men like Thomas Jefferson. So how do you think we should approach people like Jefferson, who obviously, I mean, I think from what you said, didn't live up to his own ideals. He owned slaves. He recognized, it sounds like, the moral evil of that couldn't bring himself to apparently abandon the practice. How, what do you think is an appropriate way to look at flawed figures, which is really everyone in history? I mean, I mean, it is about everyone in history. I mean, you know, in our own times, I think we have deep flaws as well. I think it's very easy to look back on a time in which, again, slavery was very much a reality. I mean, I, I do point my book, look, we have something in our Declaration of Independence, which says, you know, all men are created equal with certain unalienable rights. You know, life comes first on that list. I mean, and we look today at, at the United States where something like uh, you know, something like abortion uh, is something that's, that's very widely accepted in this country. I think that maybe 100 years from now, 200 years from now, you know, maybe they'll look back on us and say, how could you, how could you have let this happen? How could you have let this, this be in this, 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 this land of liberty? Uh, it's because there were some people who were brave, like Jefferson, even ones who, uh, in, to a certain extent, were very much tied to that system, that, that pernicious system. Uh, had the bravery and courage and forethought uh, to basically create the philosophical ar argument to destroy it forever. So over the past few years working with you, I have learned a lot about Andrew Jackson, who was uh, not really on my radar of cool presidents before this. <laughs> Tell me about Jackson and why you thought he was worth, um, I believe you've got close to an entire chapter in your book about him. Why do you think he's such a pivotal president? Yeah, Jackson kind of became a, a major figure after, of course, President Donald Trump uh, put his uh, portrait in the White House. Of course, he has been a major figure in our history. And I think there have been a lot of controversy over Jackson. I think a lot of people don't understand his legacy. He's attacked by people now both on the left and right. Um, but I, I do think Jackson and his generation in general uh, leave a very strong legacy. I, I call them the, the don't tread on me. A generation of Americans. And this was the first generation after the American Revolution that had to make this country work. I mean, we, we look to the founding fathers and what they created. Uh, it was Jackson's generation, the, the, the young people who were many times children when the, the American Revolution was ongoing, who learned the lessons uh, of war. These are people who had experienced an incredible war that most Americans today can't quite even understand. Uh, Jackson, of course, his legacy, of course, defending this country in, in the War of 1812 with the Battle of New Orleans uh, is one of the more dramatic moments in our country's history. The War of 1812 itself, kind of a forgotten war in our history. People called it the Second War of Independence. Uh, Jackson played an essential role in that war. Uh, I mean, this is a war in which uh, the United States took a lot of beatings. I mean, Washington, D.C. itself was burned to the ground. And at the very end of that war, you had a man who was completely untutored in the art of warfare, uh, defeating uh, the British military at New Orleans, a man who was the son, uh, excuse me, the brother-in-law of Wellington, uh, the hero who had defeated Napoleon's troops in Europe, uh, that this man had created this incredible defeat, uh, defeat for the British at New Orleans at the very end of that war, uh, giving Americans the national pride that we had stood up to the bully of Great Britain uh, is something that Jackson deserves to be remembered for uh, by Americans. Uh, and, and further on that, I think Jackson also, in his legacy as President of the United States, which I think many see as controversial, 
Uh, there were a lot of positives to Jefferson's, or excuse me, Jackson's worldview, relying very much on the philosophy of Jack Jefferson. He believed in a kind of federalism that is incredibly important. Uh, it's really one of the first populist movements in American history, and I think a very, in some cases, very principled one. I think the, the era before Jackson became president of the United States, called the era of good feelings, was often an era of corruption, in which D.C. did have a kind of bipartisan consensus uh, that Jackson waged war against, uh, and I think it leaves an incredible legacy uh, uh, afterwards. So I, I do like to bring up Jackson, of course, as I said, he is a controversial figure, uh, but he leaves a deep history for this country that shouldn't be forgotten. So you brought up populism, which is probably one of the most controversial concepts in our nation's history. And I think we're still fighting about it, whether you know populism is good or bad. And you see this really waged by pundits every day on cable news. Um, what do you see as, I think you used the term principled populism. What, what, what is that to you? And how did Jackson and the Don't Tread on Me generation really bring that about? Yeah, I think that the kind of principal populism, I mean, I think especially if you look at the, the writings of, of Andrew Jackson and his motives, I mean, I think he really believed that, that Washington, D.C. was becoming corrupt. And, and I think that I think there was this idea that there was a out of touch elite in the nation's capital. Of course, Jackson wrote a very kind of democratic wave. A lot of states uh, had basically direct voting for the first time uh, in political elections, which brought Andrew Jackson to the to 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 a higher office, uh, and, and I think he he very much stood against, I think, a, a, at the time, I think a, an insulated elite in, in our country. I think if you look at his ideas about federalism and things like this, this is a man who believed both in the fact that the federal union needed to be preserved, but at the same time, most policies should be should be done by the states, and his his ideas about federalism are incredibly important, and I think to a certain extent, we're, we're in an age in which I think a lot of Americans see uh, the American elite, so to speak, uh, not just in Washington, D.C., but I think academic and cultural elite uh, that's become out of simply out of touch with the American people. In his own age, Jackson was seen as a man who was very much of the American people, not above them. And uh, Americans brought him to power at a time which a lot of Americans were losing faith. And, and the institutions of their country. And I think that's why uh, he is a very important figure in our country, especially now as we're dealing with, I think, populist movements, not just in the United States, but around the world. So let's talk about Teddy Roosevelt. This is another person that I've learned a lot about since working with Jarrett. Um, you are a big fan of him, even though he is pretty controversial on the right. So what do you like about him? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and again, a lot of the figures I choose in my, my book are not simply because they are conservative or liberal, but simply because they have something that they've given us, that's something that's very important about who we are. And I think theater's legacy of Americanism is an essential part of our country. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt, very importantly, I mean, his time period, late 19th century, early 20th century, this country did have a very high level of immigration. I think it was something that really Americans were grappling with as, as demographics were changing, as we're dealing with the fact that we're a country stepping into the 20th century that looks very different. America was becoming a superpower, whereas in the 19th century, you know, we sometimes forget that the United States wasn't a, a world power, certainly in anything like what we are today. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was of that generation that was dealing with that American transition. And I think he has some of the most important things to say about what it is to be an American. I mean, he had this incredible speech. Uh, I think really, I think everybody needs to know this speech about hyphenated Americanism. He gave it at a uh, Knights of Columbus event, which at the time, we, I mean, Knights of Columbus is now, it, it was a Catholic, it's a Catholic fraternal organization, unfortunately becoming controversial yet again. Many in those days, uh, called it un-American. They said to, to be Catholic is not to be American. There were a lot of groups that were against the Knights of Columbus, including the Ku Klux Klan. And Theodore Roosevelt went to the Knights of Columbus and made this dramatic speech uh, saying, uh, denouncing the idea of hyphenated Americanism, that if you come to the United States and you embrace what this country is about, you, you are an American. And he, he chastised those who who were immigrants who didn't identify with their country, but also Americans who had been here since, you know, as long as, as, as Roosevelt's family, who had chided the newcomers who wanted to be Americans as well. And it's, a, it's an incredible attack on both um, the idea that, you know, you could be a citizen of the world or that you should embrace this whole identity rather than being an American, but also nativism. 
And I think that is what's incredibly important about Theodore Roosevelt's legacy. That's really interesting because you mentioned at the beginning that you know you think identity politics is to blame for a certain extent for the current war on history. But from what you're telling me, this is not the first time identity politics has played a big role in US history. Are there other times besides now and during Roosevelt's era that identity politics were a big problem in the United States? I mean, certainly 19th century. In fact, I think a lot of our issues today do very mirror the 19th century. I think we, sometimes we get too focused on what happened the 20th century, of course, the legacy of World War II, things like this. But again, a 19th century did have a lot of these debates of what it is to be an American. I mean, I, I, we did have large scale immigration that in, in many cases is similar to what we have today. And a lot of that didn't go very well. I mean, there was, there was a lot of violence that took place, a lot of Americans who were very distrustful of the newcomers. And this idea, how do we bring in these new people and still keep this the United States of America? At that time, they focused on patriotism. They focused on Americanism. Our schools were relentless in pushing Ameri the, the newcomers to assimilate to this country, assimilate to what it was to be an American. And I think they you know, had civic rituals. They had, uh, in our nation's classrooms, public schools actually used to inculcate uh, these values of becoming an American. You know, we, it's why we have things like the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, uh, this is something that was actually first started in uh, the mid to late 19th century as a way, especially in New York City, to basically bring in newcomers and teach them these kind of rituals of being an American. I think those are incredibly important things. And again, they were dealing with a lot of these same issues uh, that we're dealing with today, I think, but they had a very different ethos about it. So in the war in history, you do discuss, even if you think maybe we focus too much on it, World War II and the Cold War and America's role, you know, in the 1900s as a world superpower. Um, but you also write that that's misunderstood or we don't really appreciate that period correctly. Tell me about that. Yeah, I, I think it was interesting. Uh, over On Veterans Day, there was this article that was put out in, in the Daily Beast that I thought was Not the Daily shameful. Signal. Not the Daily Very Signal, clear. Daily Beast. I thought was quite shameful revisionism about the history of the Soviet Union in particular. And I think there's this idea now, and I, it's, it's happening in some academic circles, this idea that it's really the Soviet Union that won World War II, not the United States. That, you know, and, and this, this author, he, he listed out these reasons why they weren't an evil empire and blamed us for the start of the Cold War after World World War II, uh, which I think is very shameful. I think the United States' role in World War II, of course, most Americans still consider this uh, the good war. Uh, but victory in that war for free people, let's be honest, for free people, hinged on the United States. It hinged on not just the power of the United States, but I think the good qualities of the United States. I mean, can you imagine if, if Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union had been the sole victor in that war, what this world would look like today? I mean, I think, I think most should shudder at that thought. The United States was able to produce victory in that war because of its unique qualities, because we were a nation of immense prosperity. I mean, I think it's, it's nearly a miracle what the United States was able to pull off during the war. I mean, you, know, you look at just the, the city of Detroit was, uh, I believe, the fifth largest economy in the world at that time. I mean, if the Ford Motor Company had an economy bigger than the entire nation of Italy. Uh, these are incredible things that were produced by the fact that the United States had been built over, look, we're talking not very long after the creation of this country. I mean, 13 colonies up until that point was not a long period of time where the United States went from essentially a backwater uh, to the most powerful nation on earth. And it stood for things like uh, individual liberty. It stood for the Declaration of Independence, something that was about Thomas Jefferson. It stood for, it was a nation united. I mean, what would we be without uh, the rebuilding of this country after the Civil War? What would the United States' role in that war have been had we continued to be a role, a, a nation divided? Uh, you know, the, the patriotism of people like Theodore Roosevelt inculcating those values and the newcomers in America who served together in World War II and brought about the defeat of, of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Uh, those are the things that are essential qualities of the United States that allowed us to produce victory in that war and allowed there to be a great uh, end to the 20th century, really. I mean, I, and those things, I think, are being diminished now. I mean, we hear so much in our, especially in, I think, our public schools and media, we hear so much about what the bad things that America has done. But can we really imagine a world without the United States and without the role that we've played, certainly in, I think, the most important conflict, maybe in human history?
Right. And of course, I'm sure there's some kids going to public schools right now who think if uh, the United States was not around, everyone would be peacefully frolicking in a forest and getting along. But anyway, um, you also you praise Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr.'s approach to history in your book. Um, what did you like about their approach? I think what's really important, especially regarding Frederick Douglass in particular, I think he had, and I do try to bring this up on, on Fourth July, he had this incredible speech that he gave, I believe in 1852, and, and what Fourth July is to a slave. And I think his perspective was very different than, than many Americans. I mean, he, he had been an escaped slave, uh, and he made this speech uh, trying to say to Americans, you know, we still have this legacy of slavery in this country. But at the same time, he gives a very hopeful message. He says that the, 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 the fabric of what this country was built on, the Declaration of Independence, the ideas that are at the heart of America are good things. Are the, uh, basically, the potential for salvation on this come from that. It was both saying that America has this great problem, at the same time, the thing that our, our true essence, which is a country built on liberty, will eventually get rid of these things. And so it was, in some ways, a very hopeful message. Americans will come together. We will beat this thing that is against our founding principles. It wasn't saying that America was just rotten to the core, that there was no redemption for this country. It was, in fact, just the opposite of that. And to me, that really strikes me. I mean, here's a man who, who suffered more than almost anybody in this country. The most you know, terrible, evil institution of slavery had this hopeful message about the future of the country based on its essential uh, founding qualities. And that's, that's an incredible thing. And I do hope that's something that many, and of course, you talk about Martin Luther King Jr. relying on that same outlook. I mean, he, his, he had a dream for America that we wouldn't be judged on the basis of our skin anymore. I mean, that, that promise that in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, does it really mean that? I think Americans have over time used that as a calling, uh, a calling to uh, affirm that. And I think that's really important about their outlook. And I think that's something that's very much missing uh, in today's debates. So... You know, as I've mentioned, I've learned a lot from you about history. Um, one thing I'd be curious is if you were to pick a particular figure or period of time that's a bit more obscure right now in American history that you could make, you know, people who don't know as much about history know about. Like, what, what would you think? Sorry, I'm just throwing this at you. But what would be something that you would like to be better known among Americans? I, I think certainly the, the the Jacksonian era, that that time time period between uh, the Revolution and the Civil War, a lot of these debates over what we are, a lot of these cultural transformations were taking place during that time period. It's one of the, one of the reasons why I highlight Andrew Jackson in my book. These debates over slavery, these I, the ideas that make us what we are. This is a time period in which many people just thought that this was an experiment. I mean, this was going to be a temporary thing. America itself. I mean, we were the I mean the first. A true federal re constitutional republic, and, and, and really in human history, was this experiment going to work? And I think the debates in that time period are incredibly important. I mean, there was a time when everybody knew Daniel Webster's second reply to Hayne in, in the nullification crisis, and a lot of these uh, uh, debates uh, that were incredibly important. I think they're still important today, and so that that's definitely a period that I think more Americans sh should know and understand. It's not just the revolution happened, then a few years went by, and then the Civil War. Uh, there was a long period of debates about slavery, about the nature of federalism, about the nature of what it is to be an American. Uh, is your identity that of a Virginian or is it of American? And I think a lot of people, you know, those debates were often ferocious during that time period. And it was uh, one of a lot of, I mean, in America's kind of useful stage, uh, you know, it was kind of a, an aggressive time period. A lot of chaos was happening at that time. So I do think that is one of the most important stages in American history that more people need to know about. So we, uh, maybe with a little bit of tongue in cheek, called Jer and Fred Lucas's podcast The Right Side of History. But, you know, sass aside, that's a concept we hear a lot about these days. Um, I believe President Obama referred to it. Certainly um, progressives talk about it constantly. What do you think about the concept, the right side of history? I, I, so I, it is tongue-in-cheek because, of course, 
Fred and I are, are conservatives, and, and, but I think the notion of, of there being a side of history, I don't think history has a side. I mean, there are, right, there are rights and wrongs in history, but there's no side of history, as if history is being guided by this one side that will eventually triumph. I don't think that happens. I mean, you see the history of the world. I think there are a lot of good ages and a lot of very dark ones, and I think this idea that we're just perpetually moving forward to this blissful utopia in the future, I think is ridiculous, but I think is the attitude of, of many. I think it is kind of generating, you see this, the war on history itself. I mean, this, you know, this idea that we're going to go after statues and monuments to people who are now politically incorrect because they were on the wrong side of history. If only we purge their legacy forever, we can move on to this blissful utopia in the past. The oppressions, the racism, the bigotry will all be done away with if we get rid of these things who are these things that were on the wrong side of history. And I think that's a very wrong way to look at things. And so again, my, my show is very tongue in cheek and, and to a certain extent is a little bit of a dig, but I, I reject the idea that there is a right and wrong side of history. There's some there's things that are right, there are things that are wrong. Uh, but you know, we do need to look at history as sometimes very complex. Some of the people who have brought to us the greatest ideas in this world. Uh, have uh, had many other ideas that we would outright reject today. I mean, you know, that Thomas Jefferson was a, a slaveholder who brought us a Declaration of Independence. We have to account for that. How was that that he brought those ideas to the world, even though he, he knew the reality of this system itself and he, he warred against it? So, by my memory, you spent about a year writing the war on history. And of course, during that time and since, your day job has been writing for the Daily Signal, generally on news of the day. Do you think you view current events differently as a result of being so immersed in history? And if so, how? I, I, I do think you, you, you view things a little different. I think it's very important, especially as a lot of our debates are so ferocious. Uh, and, and, you know, you know, look, we have some talk of, you know, future civil war, things like that, because we are at each other. So it's, I just finished reading a book called this, this Republic of Suffering that talked about death and the civil war and how terrible it was. And I think we, we sometimes like lose. you're supposed to promote other people's books. Well, it, was, book. it was a good book. And, and it, 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 I think it hit essential things. And look, in times in our history, we have been at each other's throats. So there has been incredible violence. You know, the tragedy of that war is something that I think still leaves a legacy in this country, a very deep one. And I think that sometimes we get too caught up in the day-to-day, -day, the kind of nonsense that happens in Washington, D.C., and we lose that bigger picture of, we are very blessed and fortunate to, to be in this country, despite the, I think, the divisions among us. And I think some of them are quite severe. I think some of the differences in outlook, you know, are very problematic for our future. Uh, but at the same time, having that deeper perspective about the conflicts that have taken place in our country's history and in the wider world history, you know, we really do have lived in kind of a golden era. I just find it funny, you know, we're millennials, Kate, and so many millennials think that this, well, this must be the hardest time ever to live. It's just, you know, we've lived through so many hardships and, you know, knowing the history of even, you know, your grandparents uh, should tell you that, that that idea is quite ridiculous. Uh, and so that's an important perspective to have that whenever we do have these debates, to keep in the perspective that, you know, we have very many things that we are blessed and fortunate uh, to have today. And, and to keep that in mind is always important as we deal with a lot of these large debates about policy or whatever it is. So I'm going to open it up to questions after this question to Jarrett. So start thinking about those. But lastly, I wanted to, you know, to touch on this theme a little bit further. You know, if you watch cable news, it feels like, you know, we're in the end times. President Trump is upsetting everything. Um, you know, it just feels like a very fraught time given you know, that we're not in a world war. Um, how do you think this era will be viewed by historians? And I know that's really putting you in the spot and the hindsight is worth a lot, but what do you think? I, I do think this is a, a, there is a kind of a great tumultuous time happening right now. And we've seen, like we talked about, so many populist movements happening. I think there is this problem. I think there is a, a divide, I think, among what you would call the American elite and the common American in this country. I think there's a di difference. I mean, look at the, what happened in the 2016 election, something that I think most people in DC just never saw coming. I think that's very true. And, and, and so I think a lot of these, these issues are cropping up. What's the, what's the nature of a nation? What's the nature of a country? Uh, you know, is it better to be a citizen of the world or a citizen of your country, the United States? Uh, what does 
is patriotism a good thing or is it something that stands for, for racism and things like this? Uh, you know, these are very serious questions that I think are going to be resolved in our period. And it could, there could be some ugly times uh, ahead in our, in our future. But I, I do think it's an, it's an important moment. And I think, I hope a lot of people, especially what we've seen in the last, I mean, five, six years and even longer, uh, take this time to re reflect on what it means to be an American, reflect on what the future of our country is. Uh, you know, we've been blessed with incredible wealth, incredible prosperity, but now we have uh, the threat of a rising China, which I think stands for many things that Americans have always been against. Uh, and we have many threats around the globe that the United States is going to be, you know, if we were the essential uh, nation in the 20th century, we're going to be so again. It's important that Americans resolve a lot of these issues that we have so that we're a strong, united country, uh, one that embraces the liberty that is the legacy of our founding. Okay. Uh, do you want to have the first questions? Um, do the, just bring the mic around. Brilliant. Total, really brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, could you say something about the, um, the most connected generation is actually being quite isolated and the near universal retreat to safe spaces on college universities and what this portends for history and uh, how, uh, is there a solution to this? I mean, I think there is a solution to this. I mean, I think that many young Americans are looking for those communities that are disappearing. And it does worry me. I think we're a nation that is in many ways coming apart. People are looking for something to identify with. I think that's why we've seen a rise in identity politics, too. Uh, and I think that's why it's so essential right now. I mean, that, you know, that problem of isolation uh, leads to a lot of pathologies. I mean, we've seen these pathologies uh, break out into violence and terrible things in this country. And I think that's why it's so important to reestablish these civic institutions that have been so important. America's about individualism and, and, and limited government individual liberty, but it's also been about community. And I think for the millennials and, and Generation Z coming after us, I think these are going to be important things to rebuild. And it's why I focus very strongly on history, because for a lot of young Americans, they feel they're kind of alone in the void, so to speak. All they've heard is some bad things about their country. They're unmoored from the church. They're unmoored from their families. Many of their families are, are broken apart. Uh, these are the things that uh, I think kept Americans strong in the past. And I think that I think we are at that critical time period where these things do need to be rebuilt. They're going to be different than how they were 50 years ago. But I think a lot of Americans see this as a problem. And I, I think this is why we need to continue to double down on teaching the youngest Americans about their history and about what came before them, the things that have bound them to their parents, their grandparents, uh, and to the generation of Americans who are not related to them. Uh, I think that's why that's so critical, especially at this time. In the gray shirt, a question. Hi. It seems like the whole basis for the attack on American Constitution and history is the argument that America is somehow racist. They use that word racist constantly and inevitably. Um, what I would like to see is how can we take the whole concept and definition of racism away from the left wing and use it to our advantage? Like, I like to tell people the problem with all these left wingers who constantly announce that something or somebody is racist is that they've obviously turned into awful racists themselves. It's kind of like vigilantes, which are formed to oppose crime but soon turn into criminal organizations. So the question would be, how can we redefine that term racism and use it to our advantage? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the disturbing things, especially from the hard left now, is this idea that you know, color blindness is racism too. I mean, that's what you get with identity politics, where you can't have a, even a rational or reasonable debate with people. It's simply, you know, this is, this, these are my truths, and because I identify as this, I'm right and you're wrong. It's just it's that simple. I think that's a very I think that's a very ugly thing. I think it's very much against the legacy of our country. I think our, the idea that America is its legacy is entirely based on racism and slavery. I mean, of course, I think many of you have heard of the New York Times 1619 project, which tries to I mean, they even say tries to reframe American history as nothing but basically based on on slavery 1619, which when they say it was when slavery was introduced in the Americas, that's actually I mean that's factually incorrect. There was slavery in Americas before uh, 1619, uh, but it, it basically tries to refound America away from 1776. 
and its legacy. Its legacy, I, I believe, is the exact opposite. And you can go back right to the Declaration of Independence and see that our country was based on the idea of all men are created equal. I mean, that is our, our legacy as a country. Obviously, racism and, and terrible bigotries and prejudice existed, as they will exist not just now, but in the future. I mean, I think for many, the idea that, you know, human nature can be simply fixed overnight if we simply, you know, embrace these kind of identity politics, I think it's a folly. I think it's a, a misguided notion. I think we do have an incredible legacy uh, of liberty uh, that very much goes against the idea of, of racism and things like this. So, I, but I think it's very important that, you know, Look, I mean, you're going to get a lot of attacks that, you know, you're racist because you, you're patriotic. I mean, and, and I mean, th uh, this sounds ridiculous, and, uh, but, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, you have to just double down in defending our history and acknowledge both the, the failings in our past, which very much exist. I mean, there has been racism and, and slavery and things like this, but that's not the essential of what this country is. That's not the essential part of what this country is. And those terrible things, I think, were very much defeated by what is essential about what is America. Uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Oh, he was oh, oh, okay. Then we can go in that order. <laughs> Actually, you're both wearing blue, so we're good. Hi, Christian. Uh, th thanks again for the book. And uh, it's very it, it organized as how you uh, use symbolic um, metaphors for each era. But it seems to me that if there is a uh, conspiracy to rewrite history, like a, a historical revisionism, the logic of that is that because everything from the very foundation of America until now is so deeply flawed, therefore, the even the um, foundational products of of all of that, including the Constitution, are flawed as well. So it has political consequences in a way where more academia plays that role. So I was wondering if you can speak to how um, academia, it, it, not so much public education, but academia then influences publication, then the media in, in uh, bringing this narrative of historical revisionism and sort of the political uh, consequences, like the logic that therefore the Constitution is flawed because America is flawed. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that is incredibly important. I mean, I think that was absolutely the role of, the, as I said, the 1619 Project. I mean, one of their first essays was basically saying, well, the legacy of capitalism comes from slavery, which I, I think is on its face is, is a ridiculous argument. But you, you can see immediately where they go. There's a reason why they're using these attacks. It's not just because they're nihilistic or they want to just simply destroy America, but they, they, they think that they're going to replace some of our foundational ideas with something new and different. I think a lot of these people at the end of the day, do embrace radical doctrines like socialism, which I think has its own incredibly ugly history, not just uh, of, uh, you know, uh, impoverishment of human beings, not just of tyranny, but also of, of racism. And also of, uh, look, I mean, there was this new poll that came out by the, the victims of communism, it was very disturbing to me, that showed that only 57% of millennials uh, think that the the Declaration of Independence gives more liberty and equality than the Communist Manifesto. I mean, it should be 100%. I mean, the, the Declaration of Independence made free men out of slaves. The Communist Manifesto made slaves out of free men. And I think that, I think there, there, because there is so much now uh, historical ignorance that's come, especially in our, our system of education, which has really let down Americans to a severe extent. It's why I so fully embrace uh, the, the issue of school choice especially because of the state of our public schools, K-12. I mean, a lot of the worst nonsense is coming from higher ed and academia. But a lot of these issues are started from kids in the second and third grade in high school. They're learning these things. I mean, books like A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, deeply flawed uh, piece by a man who was a Marxist, uh, is, is one of the most highly used books in American high schools. Uh, you know, there needs to be a way around that system. That's why the issue of school choice, I believe, so strongly. And, you know, if our schools are, are doing the opposite, I mean, they, they used to be about assimilating Americans and making them Americanized. If they're doing the opposite of that, we do have to start to wonder about our vast, vast uh, investment in those schools. I mean, we need to be able to send our kids elsewhere. We need to be able to homeschool. We need to have these different alternatives. I mean, that needs to be a priority issue for people who care about the future of this country. The other gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> Hello. Um, first, I want to say I, I taught call, um, American history at the university level for 10 years, and you're exactly right. You're right on track. And I would say that postmodernism is one of the biggest infections of, the, um, of academia, especially the humanities. That's undermining what we're seeing. But 
My question is, um, do you see a link between the decline of um, interest and influence in redemptive faiths and the rise of this one sin and you're done kind of culture? That, and that's that's a great question. I do actually. Weirdly enough, you know, this kind of social justice movement to go after statues and things like that. It, it has kind of taken the characteristics of an, like an almost religious movement. That the, the zealotry, this idea that you know you must be converted, you must believe, but at the, but without the redemptive qualities, you know, of, of of genuine Christianity. I mean, there's no there's no forgiveness. I mean, there's there's no redemption. There's no afterlife. There's no redemption in, in this life. And so you're simply canceled. You go away. I mean, and and you know what? I mean, it sounds it sounds ridiculous, but I, I do think that this is a you know the kind of great awakening, so to speak. And I think that for a lot of a lot of young Americans, this is what this is what gives them uh, it gives them a sense of identity and self that's something they've lost in our country. And I think that they feel like they're a part of this movement. They're they're going to end racism forever by covering up that George Washington mural. And I think they really believe in this stuff. And I think that is a danger. That's why information is so important. I think that's why education is so important in this debate. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, a little bit of mockery of it, too, because it does get so ridiculous. Uh, but yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a kind of fervor that mirrors a religious movement without the redemption that I think is essential. Hi, Tom Spohr, Heritage Foundation. Jared, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I have a question for you. It's got to do with, uh, you know, I, I find your idea of not using a, a lens made in 2019 to look back through all of history and judge people accordingly appealing. I was wondering if uh, when you look back, are there times where people would kind of lose, even if, if they have departed, I guess, from what we would even consider a, an acceptable standard at the time, uh, and the person that comes to mind, at least my mind, is Nathan Bedford Forrest, who has statues, has busts in state capitals, that type of thing, of you know, famous Confederate general, but also is believed to probably have committed a massacre of black soldiers who surrendered and uh, was a grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And so do you, do you always get a blanket exemption, or are there places where you can revoke their standing uh, I, I look. I, I think we should. I mean, certainly, I think we should judge and and look at. Look, you're not just exempt from you know the morality of your time or any time because of you know. Well, you're in a part of history that you know didn't believe in those things. I think we can look back and say, well, these people did terrible things in history. These people, you know, failed or they made the wrong choices. Uh, you know, but of course, these things are very you know complicated. I think. Somebody, a colleague, actually recently talked to me about the issue of uh, another Confederate general named P.G.T. Beauregard, uh, who very, he actually, I think, was part of the design of the Confederate battle flag, uh, whose statues have been removed in New Orleans in 2017 after the war. Uh, he actually became an advocate for black civil rights and voting uh, in Louisiana, was actually a great champion there. Uh, it's it's interesting to see his his statues because of course he fought for the Confederacy, but at the same time after the war fought to restore uh, voting rights to black citizens. I mean that's that's obviously a complicated legacy of a man who had a change of heart. I mean his statements are actually quite incredible. I find it amazing that you know there's a Confederate general who probably did more to try to actually get uh, black voting rights in this country than you know your woke social justice war on a college campus today. I think that's a maybe a dramatic example. And so people's histories, I mean, sometimes, yes, people have made some very bad decisions. I think we can learn from those decisions as well. I think it's very important. There were many good people who fought for bad causes and many bad people who fought for good ones. I think that's important to understanding our own world today and the decisions that we have to make as well. I mean, there were some people. I mean, I, you know, I wrote my book about Robert E. Lee. I think, you know, obviously ended up fighting for the Confederacy as a general there. It was in many cases a very good man who fought for this, this cause that ultimately broke the country that he loved. And then, of course, his legacy after the war. How do you rebuild that country that, you know, where you had Americans at each other's throats? And that, that took you know, the ideas of redemption, the ideas of forgiveness, malice toward none, charity for all, the ideas of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we can accept the fact that so many, many people in our past have made the wrong choice, have done immoral things, yet still embrace what it is essential about our country and, and the good things that have come to us as well. There is a question back there. 
Um, thank you so much. I did have a chance to read almost all of the book. I didn't. Uh, I think the Antifa chapter is um, is left, so I'm looking forward to that. And I, I want to put a disclaimer on my question. First of all, I am a contributor to the Daily Signal. I've been a conservative since I was born. I am a Republican since 11. I'm a former appointee in the uh, uh, Trump administration. I do have a question, though, about the the way in your book. I feel like you are um, doing a lot to apologize for the misdeeds of some of our great American um, leaders. And I don't know that it's necessary to actually apologize for their bad behavior. And I would say that there is actually a right and wrong side of history. I think that um, any human being who actually owned other human beings, they were on the wrong side of history. And that goes for George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, even, even, even those that freed their slaves. I think that, that it's okay for us to say that they were wrong and that behavior was wrong. And, and I even think looking at it from a 2019 lens, because there were people in their present time who also understood that actually owning people was wrong, I think it's okay for us to say, I don't want to celebrate that. I also will, would like to understand there are people who are um, who I believe have home, who no no home training who who um, throw um, things on statues and spray paint statues that's bad behavior um, but I don't know that it's necessary for us to to celebrate to always celebrate the life of people who actually owned people who actually mistreated people and I would also say just really quickly I think that as that the war on history there's also a lack of inclusion in history. So as like as I mean, I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. So in the 80s, I didn't I couldn't read books history um, cl books in my civics classes that celebrated the life of African Americans or Hispanic Americans. It just was not in there. The Crayola coloring box of 64 colors showed flesh, and that was not my skin tone. It was peach. So there are people who have been excluded from history, and I think the war like this this eagerness to rewrite history is in some cases, it's an eagerness to tell more of history. I do not condone um, defacing statues, but I just want a more full history. Uh, and actually, I, I mean, I think that's that's a good point. And I, I, I think one of the problems with this moment is that, you know, we, we instead of being inclusive as far as our history and celebrating more, and, and I do hope certainly in some of my writings and elsewhere, uh, can bring back the stories of many Americans who have been forgotten, who have an incredible legacy. You know, it's not just about Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. There were a lot of other great Americans, too, who unfortunately have been uh, buried. I think, you know, we are seeing a restoration, for instance, of uh, Frederick Douglass, who I think is one of the, probably the, one of the five greatest Americans in our country's history. A lot of Amer young Americans don't know much about him, and a lot of other figures, too. And I think the important part of this, and I think that the real problem with this movement to destroy statues and stuff, is it's not, it's not very inclusive at the end of the day. It's less about celebrating other heroes or other people who have done great things, but simply finding other people to destroy. And I think that that's an important part. I think part of our, our country's legacy, I, I did bring this up in, in the chapter about uh, Christopher Columbus. I mean, many uh, groups, especially Catholic, Italian groups, mid 20th century were building statues to Columbus, who to a certain extent was controversial. There were, the Ku Klux Klan hated uh, the idea that we're gonna have some kind of Columbus Day because you know this represented Catholicism and new immigrants and things like that. But they built these statues. They didn't go looking for, you know, oh, we need to get rid of those Protestant statues down the street that, you know, that guy was a nativist, you know. They, they looked to build something positive and celebrate the good things and the in, included more contributions from more Americans. And I think that's what's important part of this. We should be building upon our history. Much of it has been forgotten. And, and that legacy, it, look, it's, sometimes it's very clouded. Uh, but I think that's what's more important in this debate. I don't think we're going to ultimately end, you know, bigotry and racism by destroying statues. I think we're going to, we can do a better job of exploring the history of ending things like slavery and ending things like racism and the people who are a critical part of that, you know, more statues should be built to them. More ce celebrations of their legacy should happen in this country. Absolutely. Okay, we've got time for one last quick question. You went up over there. Hi, I'm Olivia O'Sullivan from the Federalist Society, and I just want to build off of that question about including more voices in history. And so as we include more voices and more points of view and perspectives in history of new types of individuals who actually reshaped um, our country's history, and that 
inclusion perhaps um, casts a shadow on the figures that we already know, like Andrew Jackson, um, how might we go about addressing that past glorification of them, like these figures and putting up statues of uh, commem commemorating their contributions to history? How do we re-examine and reshape our perceptions of uh, these figures, including those new voices, without losing history? I, th I think there are a lot of ways to do it. I think that's one of the reasons why I am for preserving this, the statues very, very, I think that's really important. I think there are a lot of people who say, well, we should get rid of them because they're offensive or we should move them to museums and things like that. I think they should be left in their places. Whether they're, the person is somebody we no longer want to celebrate or somebody that we find very controversial because it tells a story, uh, not just of the person who's being depicted, but also of the community at that time. I mean, there were some statues that were a product of people who were racists or bad things. We should, we should be telling that story. That's part of the, the complex part of what this country is. I think sometimes this idea that, you know, everything about America's history must be glorious because how did we get where we are if it just wasn't all glorious? And if it's not, well, then it just must have all been bad. I think we can, we can accept the fact that, you know, this country was built out of things that were sometimes there were bad things that took place. There were some people who were... Uh, you know, wrong on a lot of issues that are somebody we can celebrate now and bring that about. And so I think, you know, a large part of this is simply ed greater education about the past, which I think has been very much missing. It's about including more figures who I think have been simply forgotten. And look, I think it's important. I, I, I don't think it's good to whitewash history. In fact, if anything, that creates a lot of these problems we're seeing. People think, well, American history has been whitewashed so it must have all been bad. They've been hiding from us this whole time that it was actually bad. If you do have a more nuanced view of history and do understand, especially as we look at our own times, there's so many controversial ideas that 10 years from now, we could even 10 years from now, we could be horrified that some Americans embraced. Understand the humanity of those people and understand the humanity of these people who dealt with that. And yet, at the same time, with all these people with wrong ideas, we still have this great country that's very powerful, very prosperous, a place that people want to be, I think is an incredibly important part of this whole, this whole debate and discussion. So I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up with that. But again, the book is The War on History. It's available for sale uh, right outside these doors. And thank you all so much for coming.